Hello, welcome back to another Ask Lattice. I have today with me, I have Mina, who is going to be tackling some nutrition topics with me. And uh, Mina and I were talking off camera um, a second ago, and I was explaining that uh, my nutrition knowledge and expertise is kind of low. Um, and so we're going to talk today on a much lower beginner, inter not well, beginner basic level and tackle some of those things that I think you out there who aren't really advanced in nutrition, perhaps like me, um, will find really useful. So bear with me with some of these, Mina, because I might go in relatively low. Okay. Um, so let's start off with talking about um, uh, sort of basic nutritional requirements and sort of demands on the body because I'm going to kind of start the first question with one that's a bit personal to me that I did a lot more running over the last two years or so and it was the first time in my life where I realised there is a point where the body gets very upset when you don't give it enough fuel and it really I suppose changed my mindset because I came from a climbing background where I kind of just got away with a lot of very poor nutrition. Mm -hmm. So what, what are the kind of the fundamental sort of demands and how much nutrition fueling do we actually need in climbing? Sure. So I think like a real pillar of sports nutrition is energy. So essentially making sure that you are getting enough fuel, enough food for the work that your body's doing. So when you were running, for example, your calorie needs were probably really, really high. And Tom was doing, you know, like ultra um, marathon type runs. Right, so you really will have noticed that gap if you weren't bridging the gap with your nutrition and changing and increasing essentially the amount that you were eating. And there's various different ways that you can do that, but essentially what I'm getting at is that you need to look at how much you're expending, your overall energy expenditure, and try and match that up with food. So this will vary for climbers. So some climbers, for example, if you're bouldering a couple of times a week, your energy level, your energy needs are gonna be lower than someone who's like, out doing like long sport climbing days, five days a week. So energy is probably gonna be the number one and then you're gonna look at the intensity of what you're doing. And so for higher intensity sports and climbing really comes into that higher intensity bracket, um, carbohydrate is gonna be your main fuel source. So it's really making sure that you're fueling adequately with carbohydrate around those sessions. Uh, okay, so, so really an important part here is for most people to understand that their everyday life and activity sort of has a, an energy need, mm -hmm. and then you have to build on top of it how frequent your climbing is and how intense it is, because you, you have to kind of put a bit extra in the box for that on top of your normal life. Exactly, yeah. And I think, you know, it's easy to get, um, you know, people are often like, but how do I work that out? And we know where do I go with the numbers? But even if you are working that out, like we do for people here in the nutrition services, all these numbers are estimates. So there's a lot of trial and error involved, even if you are working out the numbers. But essentially, yeah, you've got to think, there's almost three stages, actually. There's your basic um, bodily function needs. So even at complete rest, if you were to stay in bed all day, you still need to eat, right? Because your body is doing so much stuff in the background, hormone production, brain activity, um, loads of different things, right? And so that's what, when we talk about energy availability, um, we're talking about providing enough energy for your basic bodily functions. The next stage up is going to be your kind of daily living activity. So that might be your job, your, you know, so for example, if you work at a desk all day, you're going to have a lower need than, say, a nurse who's on her feet all day. But we're still not quite talking about structured exercise yet. So that's the next step up is then, okay, what do I need to add on top for my 30 minute run or my six hour run yeah. or my climbing session? Um, and like I said, there's going to be a, a certain amount of trial and error there. Uh, so, so, so very individualised, really, as well. And so, as a, I, I suspect, and what I've sort of discovered over the last, you know, couple of years, especially with this, you know, additional activity that I was doing on top of my climbing, is I think I was probably a chronic underfueler mm -hmm. in terms of my climbing. So, but I never, I didn't really notice it, mm -hmm. particularly in climbing. I was still climbing really well. So, what are the, some of the key. Uh, sort of markers for where you might go, maybe I might be doing that. So for example, I remember you said something to me recently where you went, if you're needing loads of caffeine every single time to sort of G you up and wake you up, yeah. that might be an indicator because I went, 
oh my goodness, yeah, I have needed caffeine very badly <laughs> for a long time with that. So are there yeah, sort of things you can look at? Sure, caffeine's an interesting one, actually, and don't get me wrong, I love coffee, and it's a great ergogenic aid, but I think often we see this pattern of people that are under fueling are kind of propping up their energy with, with caffeine because they're probably just not quite eating enough. Mm. I mean, some key things you'll see with people that are chronically under fueling um, are not recovering very well, generally low energy levels, not much get up and go, hence maybe turning to things like caffeine to get that energy boost. Um, yeah, maybe not building lean mass very well, because if you're in a what we call a kind of breaking down a catabolic state more often. It means you're not in that building growth state where you're going to develop more lean mass. So you might think, oh, I'm doing quite well with my endurance maybe, but oh, when I do strength sessions, I'm just not seeing that, that development that I would expect to see. So you might, um, you might also struggle with sleep. Libido often yeah. drops off. Okay, well, that's some, yeah, some good yeah. little markers there to look at. And I, um, and I assume that, again, those are individualized, so you can't say... Everyone will get all exactly. three, four, five things, those, but exactly. look out for them. Look out for them. And for women, uh, menstrual cycle. Ah, okay. Can yeah. either become irregular or eventually drop off yeah. completely. Okay. Brilliant. That's a good start. Uh, okay, so next question, um, and this is one posed from our kind of lattice community on social media and everything like that, was um, how long um, do you feel like we should be eating and fueling before a session and Essentially, the question is sort of two sides. Can you get away with not eating for one, one, two, three hours before a session? How important is it? What's the basics here? Right. So again, with a lot of nutritional stuff, it kind of depends and it's quite individual. People have, um, you know, different gut microbiomes, different kind of abilities to digest um, and different kind of discomfort levels with that. So it, it does vary. You'll find some people that it can eat quite a lot you know, a short time before training and other people that really just need to leave it a little bit longer. Mm. Also depends on the type of exercise you're doing. If you're, say, going for a run, you might want to leave it a little bit longer. Um, but we'd be looking at somewhere in the kind of one to three hours before exercise, it would be good to be getting some fuel in. Um, what you can do is have something, say, three to four hours before and then have a smaller top up one hour before you go out for your run or you go out for your climb. Yeah. And is that, is that basically for blood glucose levels so it's like the it's having the because uh, from my perspective I, I always so I'm a I'm an eater where I go if I eat anything in the two even two to three hour I just feel really sluggish I just don't feel like doing anything I'd rather just sit down and read a book mm. um, but if I leave a quite a good break before doing activity I feel super sharp like really you know snappy on mm. it and feel really high energy is What's the kind of... Yeah, it's an interesting one. So it's blood glucose to a certain extent and also um, muscle glycogen stores that we're trying to kind of top up before you exercise. It also depends on the type of foods you're eating. So in your case, I'd be like, what are you eating, you know, two, three hours before? Are you having kind of slower, complex carbohydrates or are you having kind of sugary hits? Birthday that... cake? Yeah, maybe not ideal. Okay, so no birthday um, cake. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not, I mean, I'm not saying no birthday cake. <laughs> Everyone should eat birthday cake, right? But um, it might not be like your ideal thing if you're having that like three hours before training and you're having nothing else. Um, and also for, for a lot of people, fiber, um, fiber is a really good thing. It's really important for our health and our, and our gut health. But having a lot of fiber just before you exercise can result in some um, GI distress. Uh -huh. um, so for some people, some people seem to tolerate it really well. But for some people, cutting down a bit on fiber just before exercise might be helpful. Next question mm -hmm. uh, is uh, another one that came from uh, the questions. And I've also made this change myself in my own um, nutrition. And over the years, because I, I felt that basically the, the meat quality that we get in the supermarkets has gone down a lot over the years, mm -hmm. I've tended to go more towards a vegetarian diet. Mm -hmm. So I've gone from being someone who had meat perhaps four times a week to now maybe only one to two times a week. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of important things that any of us that are moving more down that vegetarian you know, sort of spectrum should be looking out for in terms of what we're eating to support our training recovery etc sure so one of the main things you want to think about is protein and there's some great plant-based sources of protein so that it's not a worry it's not something you can't get from meat it just might take a little bit more thought 
um, to make sure you're getting a kind of optimal serving of protein um, a certain number of times a day to, to maximize your training kind of response. And um, what we're essentially trying to do is optimally sti stimulate a process called muscle, muscle protein synthesis, yeah. which is all about kind of repair and, and growth of um, lean mass. So when you're taking something like meat out, absolutely fine. Animal products essentially are just like a really simple way to get complete protein. And when I say complete, it's, it's when proteins have enough of all the um, essential amino acids in them. So plant proteins do have all the essential amino acids, but not quite in high enough levels. So you're looking at combinations. So for example, often things like grains and legumes will combine to give you a complete profile. So if you have a lentil curry with some rice, that will give you a complete profile of protein in the same way that an animal product will. But if you just have the lentils, you might be a little bit low on some of them. So it just takes a little bit more um, thought. I mean, also you might be reducing meat, but you still have things like dairy and eggs that are complete protein sources. Yeah, um, so like I absolutely love milk. Yeah. And I probably have, I'd say a pint of milk every single day. Yeah. Is that um, a good thing? I, don't, yeah, I have no idea if even that's a good thing or not. Milk's actually great, yeah. It's like a really good source of um, complete protein. It's really high in leucine, which is a particular amino acid that's really important in signaling muscle protein synthesis. It's also really great for electrolytes. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, so I'm And, and is there any milk. difference also uh, from a, a sort of training recovery point of view when we're talking about protein in milk particularly, because I guess a lot of people drink milk, between uh, full fat milk and skimmed milk? Yeah, so interestingly, I mean, essentially with skimmed milk, all you're doing is re reducing the fat content, mm -hmm. fat content. There are actually some studies showing a better response to whole milk yes. than, I know, I was so pleased yes. when I saw those studies, um, than to um, semi-skimmed and skimmed. Um, I'd have to dig into the studies to, to tell you details, but I remember seeing those and being like, huh, okay. Um, I mean, okay. fat is an important part of our diet and it's important to get a different ar array of, you know, saturated, monounsaturated mono -unsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. Um, and, you know, that's a whole other subject, but mm. fat isn't something we should be kind of completely steering away from. I think it's got a bad name yeah. um, in the past, but it's really important for kind of um, you know, precurs precursors for hormones, building immunity, you know, the absorption of vitamins, things like that. Okay. Last question on mm -hmm. the... Um, kind of vegetarian thing is uh, if I was to take <coughs> whey protein, mm -hmm. it's kind of like that, that supplement powder, and is it g generally recognised as a good source of protein? Because it's still in a powder and it's, you know, like the supplement and you know, it's what I feel like bodybuilders do more of. Yeah, so whey protein's great. It's a really good source of protein, um, high in leucine. A lot of researchers actually used whey as a kind of gold standard for that muscle protein synthesis response. So yeah, it's really kind of um, widely supported in the research as being good. An old lecturer of mine actually used to say, you know, we need to stop talking about whey as this supplement because it makes it sound really um, kind of chemically or, or you know, somehow... Um, something negative yeah. um, when actually it's really just a food it's you know it's in the cheeses it's in milk it's it's in dairy products it's just a, a kind of um, refined down version uh, okay well, that's interesting um okay moving on to another question that we've been asked about uh and this is one that i've seen asked regularly on social media and uh within my own clients that i work with uh, and as you know me, probably a little bit personal to me as well, um, you can probably see I've got whole sorts of things <laughs> I could sort out with this, um, is how should we deal with uh, nutrition or fueling if we work very long hours and we may be sort of heavily based on a desk-based job for part of the day, but then we want to be very active, say at the end of the day when we're training in the evening, should we be doing some sort of mini periodization of the food across the day how do you deal with that yeah I mean you you definitely can do I think for a lot of people it's about getting the basics right first and I think sometimes with nutrition people fall down because they try and overcomplicate things mm -hmm. and like we said at the beginning it's first of all looking okay what are my energy needs for this day and also what did you do the day before because you know if we look at a day completely on its own and think well there's no exercise in the morning and then there's going to be a ton of exercise in the evening you might think well I could kind of eat a little bit less during the day and then eat a bit more in the kind of four to five hours before that um, session. And you think, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. But if you've also trained the night before, that breakfast meal is going to be a recovery meal as well 
from the night before. So it's, it's looking slightly zooming out and looking at the bigger picture of someone's needs. Mm. And I think essentially I would, for most people, I would urge them to go a little bit more simpler to begin with. Look at, okay, what are my overall needs in the week? What does my week look like? How much am I doing overall before you're zooming in completely onto the day? And then taking that day in the context of the days around it as well. Because, you know, I think we often see this with climbers, or I often see this with climbers, that they have a rest day and they think, right, okay, I don't really need to eat very much um, because I'm not doing anything. Right. And there's a certain amount of sometimes people feeling guilty if they want to eat more. But, you know, a rest day is a recovery day and it's a fueling day for the next day. So if you've trained or climbed the day before and you're going to train or climb the day after, that rest day is super important for, like, recovering giving your body all the nutrients it needs to kind of make those adaptations and recovery processes go well. And then it's fueling up for the next day. So yes, your energy needs are going to be lower on that day in terms of the expenditure of, of that day, but they're also still really important. Uh, so it's almost like, so it's basically because there's kind of like always like a lag time in terms of food that you put into your body versus the expenditure of it. So you're not, it's not like putting fuel in your car and as soon as it goes in the petrol tank it's there ready to go it takes some time you've got like a churn essentially like a churn rate where yeah to a certain extent yeah kind yeah. of i can see what you're getting at yeah okay so just not m focusing in on the micro take a slightly larger picture yeah and and you know I think as people get more kind of specific with the nutrition, you can focus in more on the micro, but it's always got the context of what's going on around it. Yeah, okay, good answer, I like that. Um, okay, last question, this one. Um, and uh, I think this is hopefully gonna be one that people really pay attention to, because as much that, you know, you and I appreciate that we love our training and working really hard with that, and that's kind of one side of it, actually the flip side to that coin is recovery like we train hard but the only reason why we actually get fitter and stronger is because we also recover what for you as a nutritionist are the kind of fundamental elements to recovery what will actually make a difference without being you know really super clever and detailed about it what will make a difference to me or anyone else as a climber on their recovery sure so I would focus on getting some adequate carbohydrate in after your session. So when you've climbed or trained, you've used up essentially the glycogen in your muscle stores. So you want to replenish that. So we want some carbohydrate in your recovery meal and to replenish. And we're talking things like banana, a piece of bread, yeah. sugar. Well, so after recovery, I'd probably go for more complex carbohydrates. So you're talking about like whole grain rice, maybe sweet potato or potatoes, um, okay. quinoa, things like that. So... Things like bananas and kind of sugary things, I'd maybe use mid-session. You know, when you, when you say you're at the wall for like three hours or you're out climbing for half a day and you need kind of quick, more available uh, fuel during that time. Mm -hmm. But afterwards, I'd be looking at trying to, you know, you're getting that carbohydrate, but if you're choosing those complex sources, you're also getting more fiber and kind of other nutrients with them. Mm. Um, so you'd be looking at replenishing carbohydrate stores. You'd be looking at getting protein in. So... Yeah. Um, again, depending on the person, because it would be individual, a, a kind of dose of protein. With most people, you're looking between kind of 20 to 30 grams of um, complete protein source. After um, the session? After the yeah, session, yeah. ideally. Not across yeah. the whole day? Not across yeah, the whole day, yeah. no. So that's a kind of a, a recovery meal type yeah. um, dose. You'd be looking at getting some healthy fats, just generally at most meals, you know, looking at getting either some olive oil or some avocado or some seeds or you know, something in there, some olives or something that's going to just keep those healthy fats going in to support, um, uh, you know, like um, hormone production and things like that. Um, and then your fruits and vegetables. So right. making sure you're getting plenty of different variety of whole foods, really good for your gut health, really good antioxidants and anti-inflammatory properties in all these kind of plant foods. So I think they're, they're really important. Often we see people focusing on the kind of macros and forgetting about the micros um, yeah, in terms yeah. of nutrients. So yeah, plenty of fruit and veg. And those recovery meals are the place to get it because you're not worried about GI distress and exercise because you've already done it. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. And, uh, and then for uh, drinking after training, I guess it can just be as long as something that hydrates you. It doesn't really matter what form yeah. it comes in. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of drinking water. I know a lot of people aren't, but yeah. I, I really like drinking water. I mean, like we were saying earlier, milk's actually great for 
for rehydrating you. I mean, really, you don't want to be playing catch up after exercise if possible. You want to be starting your exercise hydrated because um, uh, it makes a big difference to things like rate of perceived exertion, things like that. So you really want to be starting your exercise hydrated and trying to maintain it through your exercise. Mm. And so then afterwards, you're not playing this huge kind of deficit catch up in terms of hydration. Um, one of the biggest things I say to people is monitor the color, the color of your urine. It's really simple. You know, everyone ha will have a slightly different sweat rate and slightly different fluid demands um, in any given situation. So, you know, trying to aim for that pale straw color in, in your urine. Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, awesome. That was uh, really fascinating. And um, I've just learned a whole load in the last <laughs> half an hour. And you kept on saying things and I was going, oh, well, I'm not quite doing that, am I? And these are real <laughs> basics. Yeah. Which makes me realize that it comes down to this this thing of like, get your basics in nutrition sorted out before you go down the com complex stuff. Because even I default to going, oh, well, I have a thing about nutri you know, nutritional supplements. But if there's basics that you're telling me now that I know I'm not quite getting right, those are really the head yeah. of the list, aren't they? Yeah, and there's no real point, I don't think, in going into the nitty gritty of like specific supplements if you're not kind of doing the basics of, of fueling right. Um, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that, Mina. Cool. Uh, good to chat again. And we will see you again very soon. Don't forget to click on your notifications and subscription to our channel if you want to get these coming up in your feed every week. We normally have two videos out every week. And also, if you want to have uh, any additional input from Mina, she writes both nutritional reports and personalized training plans and is also active on our Lattice 365 group. So we will see you again very soon.